podcasting to you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm your host, Brad Johnson. Welcome to The Theory of Wine. In today's podcast, we go overseas. We'll talk with a South African winery owner, Tim Pearson of the United Kingdom. We're going to talk about South African wines, running a winery business from 6,000 miles away, and we're going to learn about heaven on earth. Stick around. Support for this podcast comes from the new documentary film, Wine Diamonds, Uncorking America's Heartland, streaming now at WineDiamondsFilm.com and from WineryBoost.com, Influence Marketing for the Wine Industry. My guest, Tim Pearson, is the owner of Seven Springs Vineyard, a winery located in Hermana, South Africa, and is coming to us via Zoom from the United Kingdom. Tim started his own commercial cleaning business from scratch called GoldcrestCleaning.com in the United Kingdom in 1993. Growing his business to employ over 250 people has allowed him and his wife Vaughn to indulge in their passion to establish a vineyard from scratch in South Africa. In 2006, they purchased 30 acres of land, planting vines in 2007 and 8. Hence, Seven Springs Vineyard was born and they entered the wine world. Seven Springs Vineyard is a premium wine producer situated in the seaside town of Hermanus in the picturesque Western Cape, South Africa. The vineyard is nestled between two mountain ranges, and the nearby ocean influence and shale soils gives their vines the potential to produce exceptional grapes from north and south-facing vineyards. Tim grows Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Syrah, and Pinot Noir. Tim Pearson, welcome to The Theory of Wine. Thank you, Brian. I'm really happy to have you on the show here, Tim. Um, you are my first international wine um, celebrity or wine owner, winery owner, and I'm really excited to have you here, and I'm excited to have the folks of uh, the United States and the rest of the world, whoever listens to the podcast, uh, get to know you like I've known you for for a good while. You know, we, we first uh, connected back oof, almost a decade ago when my brother and I were doing the Two Wine Brothers blog. And so, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty cool to, to chat with you here. So let's just kind of launch into it. How did you end up in the wine world? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know um, is the answer. Yes, I do. <laughs> and what happened was, um, uh, obviously, we, we live in the UK, still we live in England. Um, but we lived in South Africa in, in 1994, 1995. We were going to buy a small business over there um, in an area a long, long way away from where they make wine. Uh, we were going to buy um, a small cleaning business near the Kruger National Park, which is in the northeast of the country. No, sorry. Yeah, the northeast of the country. Um, uh, the wine-producing region of South Africa is in the southwest of the country um, near Cape Town. Um, the business didn't work out, so we came back to the UK. Um, a guy who was a bit of a crook, so we told him uh, we weren't going to buy the business. Um, but we'd lived there for six months, fell in love with the country, um, loved the potential, loved the wild feel of Africa. Um, so 2005 was our 25th wedding anniversary. Um, we went back to the Cape for a three-week holiday um, uh, in October 2005. Um and it was Vaughan, my wife, who said, um, look, you're always talking about wishing to do something in the wine industry or um, let's have a look and see what there is over here. Uh, we went to Stellenbosch, um, w which is the most probably well-known area of South Africa for winemaking. Um, we visited Stellenbosch and then one or two other areas. Um, the price of buying something... Um, that was already up and running was too much. It was a, that was a lot of money. We didn't want to um, spend a lot of money on it because we didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So we went to a place called Hermanus where you said the vineyard is very close to. We spent two days there, went down the wine route there, and there were only about three wineries at the time. And Vaughan, my wife, said, look, if we're going to do anything, this would be the perfect spot. So came back to... Um, Came back to the UK, did a few web searches, found a piece of land that was for sale, mm -hmm. um, contacted the owners, um, said, okay, we'll buy the land. As you said, it's around 30 acres. Bought the land. It had cattle on it. It was very rough land. And as you said, we planted vines 2007, 2008. So I guess to answer your question in a very big nutshell, that was how we got into the wine business. 
Wow, this, that's a, it's, it's quite a distance. How far is it from where you live in, um, in England down to the southern end of uh, Africa? Haven't walked it, Brad, so I can't really <laughs> tell you from uh, but, um, but now it's about 6,000 6, miles. But the, the beauty about it is uh, we're in a very similar time zone, so um, there's only two hours' time difference between South Africa and the UK. Right. So... Um, so when we go there, um, which is usually once a year, just after the new year for two and a half months, um, there's not too much jet lag. Right. So, um, yeah, that's good. That's 6,000 so, miles. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a vast distance. So you're, you're managing running, you own a winery in South Africa, you live in England. Um, tell us about how that, how you, the initial getting grapes in the ground on this new piece of land that you bought. How did you go about doing that when you're so distant or did you spend time down there during that process or describe that process to us? No, we didn't, but it's, um, uh, the guy we bought the land off was a, was a farmer. Uh, unfortunately, Brian Davison, the guy we bought the land off, uh, died, a year ago, Brian was in his um, late 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a, effectively a sheep farmer, or a, um, but he knew that the land was probably capable of making wine because of the soil type, because of the, um, the distance from the Atlantic Ocean. We're about, about in miles, about four, four and a half miles from the Atlantic Ocean in a valley. Mm-hmm. Um, but fortunately, his son, or one of his sons, he has three, um, managed a couple of other vineyards in the valley. So he was already doing some vineyard management. So I guess the land came with a, um, uh, a guy that could plant the vines for us. Nice. Um, but we obviously needed to choose the vines and do all of that sort of stuff. So we took advice from people. We knew that the, the area was making Pinot Noir. We knew that the area was making um, Chardonnay. Um, and very, very good examples of, of those two varietals. Uh, but I had a sneaking feeling I wanted to plant some Syrah as well because I felt uh, the land was perfect for Syrah to produce a, more of a Rhone-style um, uh, uh, wine than a, um, an Australian Barossa-style Shiraz. Mm-hmm. So the first vines we planted were, were Syrah, or Syrah, um, and then we planted Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, and then in 2008 we planted um, Pinot Noir. Nice. And but P- Peter did that for us. Peter managed and still manages our vineyard for us to this very day. Oh, that's wonderful. So when you when 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 you think of South African wines, what grapes jump to you? I mean, are these the grapes of South Africa now? I mean, I remember early in my wine wine kind of thinking career that, you know, Pinotage is the thing that, you know, a lot of us were talking about. This has been a decade ago that was planted there. So when you think of South African wines, what grapes are coming to mind for you? Well, um, the, the wine you said, or the variety you said, Pinotage is still very much at the forefront, if you like, of people's minds when they think of a South African wine. Right. Um, Pinotage was a cross between Pinot Noir and Sanso. Sanso was called um, Hermitage in South Africa. It was 1921, I think it was, uh, in the University of Cape Town. A guy called um, Isaac Perold was a professor at the university. He actually crossed the two vines together and came up with this thing that they call Pinotage. Mm -hmm. So that's where it was born. Um, so Pinotage on the red side, and I guess um, uh, um, Chenin Blanc uh, on the, the white side. Chenin Blanc has been grown a number of years in South Africa. It was mainly used in um, years gone by for um, uh, for spirit production. Okay. Uh, the South Africans call it Steen, S-T-E-E-N. That was the name they gave it. So... Um, um, in latter years, um, they've had these old vines um, producing some exceptional uh, Chenin Blanc. In my opinion, sure. some of the best, if not the best, in the world. Mm. That sounds yum. So, as as you were, you know, you got the grapes in the ground, and there's that time where you start thinking you need a winemaker. At what point did you decide that you know it's time to bring a winemaker on board? Uh, okay to start with obviously we didn't need a winemaker because the grapes were growing or the vines were growing there was no 
need for a winemaker. Mm -hmm. We set our first harvest, uh, uh, say 2011, because we thought, you know, we could look at it late 2010 right. and see if the grapes were of um, sufficient quality to be able to make our first vintage in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very, very good, well-known winemaker in the valley called Peter Finlayson. Peter Finlayson um, was at Bouchard Finlayson. He was one of the partners, the winemaker at Bouchard Finlayson, who are very, very well known. Mm -hmm. um, Peter walked the vineyards with us in November 2009 and said, look, if you want to make a wine in 2010, these grapes, these vines are, um, are sufficiently forward to be able to make a small vintage. And um, then we thought, oh, well, if that's the situation, we either have to sell the grapes off or we can get our backsides into gear mm -hmm. or our asses or whatever you want to call it and um, see if we can find a winemaker. Had a very good friend who was a winemaker at a wine, winery called Baxburg. And this guy, Guillaume, said, if you are going to, if you, if you want a winemaker, I've got the perfect person. She's just worked a harvest for me mm -hmm. um, in 2009. She's very good uh, at what she's doing. She's very good at pa paperwork. Her name's Rihanna. So he gave me her contact details, Rihanna, and we gave her a call. And then we, um, we emailed her a list of questions. Mm -hmm. And then we went over to interview her. Rihanna had never made wine before as on her own. She'd always been an assistant winemaker or made wine in different vintages abroad. Um, she'd been to the Napa Valley. She'd been to um, the Rhone Valley in France. Mm -hmm. And we interviewed her in, I think, December, no, in November 2009. Mm -hmm. um, and then her mother interviewed us because Rihanna was only 25 years old. And we said, look, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. We'll, we'll give it a try. If it doesn't work out, then, you know, we'll make some other plan. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't even have anywhere to make our own wine. We'd only planted grapes. Mm -hmm. So we found a winery in a place called Elgin. And Elgin is about 25, um, 25 miles from the winery, uh, from the vineyard. So we made our first wines in a winery called Iona in Elgin, and Rihanna made our first wine. She joined us late um, late 2009, and the, 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 uh, the first vintage was harvested February, March 2010. Wow, that's a cool story. I, I remember early, in the early days that, you know, you'd even sent Rihanna over to Oregon to maybe learn a little bit about Pinot Noir making. Yeah, that was in late 2010. Um, she said to us she had never made Pinot Noir before, which was, um, you know, we knew that there was probably a... We, we knew that she hadn't made Pinot Noir before. It wasn't in her CV. She'd never been anywhere where Pinot Noir was made. Mm -hmm. So we looked at the possibilities of sending her somewhere for the Pinot Noir harvest in 2010, um, which would obviously be sort of um, uh, October, September, October time. Mm -hmm. uh, the choices were Europe or... Um, uh, America, so the USA. Mm -hmm. We decided to go for Oregon because we felt their style of Pinot Noir would be probably similar to ours and their production techniques would probably be sort of more more modern, more new world than, um, than France. So she went to, we, we, we paid for her to go to a place called Adelsheim for the 2010 harvest in, um, in the USA in Oregon, and she lived, ate, slept, dreamed, um, <laughs> uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and really loved it. Yeah, Edelsheim is a wonderful vineyard and wonderful, the wines are just spectacular, and I, I think she found a really good place to, to spend some time and to delve into Pinot Noir here in the in Pacific Northwest. Um, she loved it. Yeah, well, that's awesome. So tell us about, you know, so you've, you've got grapes in the ground, you've got a winemaker now, she's got some extra training, and um, what's, what's, what's been happening between that point and today? 
Okay, it's, um, you know, the thing is to be concise about this. I could talk for about six or seven hours. I'm not <laughs> going to do that, obviously, but um, but no, the vines grow. Uh, you have then have to establish a market. Mm -hmm. um, the second year for making our wines, we couldn't make our wines at the same winery. They'd run out of, uh, mm -hmm. of space. So we found a winery about five, six miles down the road that we could make our wines. And we've been making, we've been making our wines there for, um, uh, for the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. um, but we, um, a couple of years ago, we were offered some buildings about a mile down the road from our winery, um, our vineyard, sorry. Um, and we found, um, we found these buildings. These buildings, were, they were growing mushrooms in the buildings. Mm. Um, and when our neighbor came and said, I, I've got somebody growing mushrooms, but they're going to vacate the buildings, would you like to have a look at them? Mm. We thought that there's going to be sort of um, a, a building filled half of the horse manure with button mushrooms growing out of them. And when we got there, they were um, very much uh, um, modern production mushrooms, things like shiitake and oyster and things like that. Nice. The, the builders were agricultural builders that were perfect for our use. So we told the guy we would rent the buildings from him and we would convert the buildings. And we've been there about um, about just over 12 months now. So that's our home. So, so we're now in our own um, production facility. We're now able to rent um, space for other winemakers to be able to use that, which gives us a, very much a secondary income. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've established markets in different parts of the world. And Vaughan and I, as you know, have uh, been very much involved in it. We don't just sit back and right. let other people do the work. Um, we don't have the money to be able to afford because we were only producing um, about 50, 55,000 bottles a year. Mm -hmm. The important thing was to establish the wine to make sure that we could make decent wine and you were one of the first people in the world to taste our first ever wine our Sauvignon Blanc mm. and I remember um, getting your, your feedback and uh, about the wine and it really excited me to see that somebody was um, you know we can think our wine is the best thing since um, uh, since sliced bread mm. um, and uh, when you get feedback from people like you, it's very, it, it's very encouraging. We'll be right back with the final half of our interview with South Africa winery owner Tim Pearson of the Seven Springs Vineyard. Hey, wine friends. Each week, the Theory of Wine will bring you interesting content from winemakers, wine growers, wine rebels, writers and bloggers, and serious wine nerds from around the world. Want to join us? Connect with us at theoryofwine.com, on Facebook, or Twitter. Cheers, friends. Welcome back to the second half of our interview with South Africa winery owner Tim Pearson of the Seven Springs Vineyard as he talks about exporting wine, heaven on earth, and is over the mountain brand. Um, we've established markets in different parts of the world. Um, our newest importer is a guy based in Florida or an importer based in Florida called PG Fine Wines. Okay. They're based in Davie. And um, I remember telling you that we, um, we've just been there for two weeks promoting our wines. And I've got to say that uh, Florida seems to be a great market. There's a lot of money down there, obviously. And... Uh, you know, a big restaurant scene. Um, first time we'd ever been to Florida, but Vaughan and I went, had a great time, and um, met a lot of great people, and uh, we can see our wines establishing there, and it can probably be one of our best markets, I would think. That's that's incredibly exciting. Um, that Sauvignon Blanc is still the conversation that my wife and I have about like that's for us it was a very very special wine and knowing that we were the first in the United States to taste it and it, it's you know not only is that special but the wine itself was incredible and so that's kind Did of you, I mean I, I remember you and Jill tasted it is was your brother was is your brother is it Terry yep my brother your brother I remember yeah. so I think we, you had a couple of bottles he yep. was in a different part of the states but yeah. uh, is in DC area. So yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible. And so 
I'm, I'm thinking back to, you know, beginning this process, you're in South Africa, you have a winery, a vineyard, um, you're in production. Um, I guess, was was your initial thought that this is going to be an export business or is there much, is there much, um, is there much of an, a, a local audience for your wine there? Of course, there's a domestic market for it as there is with every, um, um, every country that produces or every area that produces wine, there is a domestic market as well. Our wines are sold in South Africa, yes. Um, with us now having a tasting room and with us now having our own winery, it, it gotcha. gives us the opportunity to sell our wines from our own winery, which obviously um, is the biggest profit margin that, that, that you make when you're selling a wine. Right. Um, we are very close to um, uh, the town called Hermanus. Hermanus is on the coast, uh, the Atlantic coast of South Africa, and it's situated in, in, not in Walker Bay, but on Walker Bay. Mm -hmm. And Walker Bay is the best land based whale, wa whale watching in the world. So you, they get a lot of tourists. And obviously, tourists don't want to stand and watch whales all day, they'll watch it for a couple of hours. So, um, um, going down a wine route and going to wineries and tasting wines and chatting to the winemaker and chatting to the people um, is uh, is what they do. So we have a great captive audience for about nine months, of, nine months of the year. So it's a long tourist season. So is your tasting room at your winery location or is there a tasting room down in, in the town? No, it's at the winery. It's, it's, it's at our winery. And our wine route is on a... Um, uh, um, we're on a, a road called the R320, Hemlonada Road. Hemlonada is Afrikaans. In Afrikaans, it means heaven on earth. Mm. And um, it's one of the most spectacular um, and beautiful valleys you could ever wish to go down. Nice. It's um, the, 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 the Tesla's Dahl Mountains that you said, there's the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. a mountain range, a valley, and then there's an, another range of mountains called Shores Mountain. And our vineyard is at the, the, the foot of, of Shores Mountain. Mm -hmm. so, so, yes, that's where we that's, that's, I totally need to get down there. That sounds amazing. Um, so when you are, I'm thinking exporting wines, um, I know even in the United States, just sometimes shipping the wines across the border here from state to state is a real headache. So what's, what were the challenges for you when you're establishing a winery from England and South Africa to distribute your wines around the world? What's been the biggest challenges for you? Um, I guess there's also a number of challenges, but the thing is, I guess growing up from a, a standing start and only producing a, a few wines to start with gave us um, a chance to, um, if you like, um, I don't know what your terminology is there, cut our teeth and just test the water, test the market. Mm -hmm. uh, we imported the wines into the UK. We imported our own wines to start with mm -hmm. until we then decided that there's no way we can run a distribution business and, 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 a, and a, um, a logistics business and import our own wines. We'll need to find our own importer, which we did. Right. So the UK was one of the first markets to import our wines, we also started uh, sending emails to one or two people uh, in different countries. And a guy um, came back with a positive reply from Denmark. Mm. He's a guy called Morton. And Morton said, yes, he'd like to taste our wines. So we sent some samples. He came back and said, yes, he'd love to import our wines. And he's still with us. He's still nice. uh, a great guy. So it, it's not just a matter of, Finding markets for us, it's about building relationships and building. You know, we are we're very much people, people, as you guessed. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's a challenge. It's a new business. I'm not going to say we went into it naively. We didn't. We, we went in with open eyes mm -hmm. um, and you know said, okay, we we'll apply logic to whatever we're doing um, with. Uh, with our winemaker Rihanna and with the staff that we're now employing in South Africa, we Skype them once, twice, three times a week. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, with modern communications, there's a, it's, a, it's far easier to keep in touch with people. And with WhatsApp messaging and things like that, if somebody has a question to ask us and we're not even it by a computer, mm -hmm. we can we can communicate with them. But it's based on trust. It's based on taking on people you have faith in, have faith that they have the right skills to do the job, 
and build a team, or albeit a team uh, many thousand miles apart. Right. But, um, you know, the challenge was getting the right people, and Rihanna's been fantastic for us. Um, um, as you're aware, Rihanna is, is, has just left the position as winemaker, so she's been with us now um, eight years, um, and no, nine years, sorry. Right. And um, she met a guy from Australia about a year and a year and fourteen months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, they um, he was in he was in South Africa. Uh, their relationship has really grown. Uh, a guy called Greg he helped us out in our um, in our um, harvest last year, uh, but unfortunately he couldn't get visa visas to live and work in South Africa. So um, the relationship um, blossomed and Rihanna came to the conclusion that the only thing she could do if the relationship was to continue was to move to Australia. Mm. So three months ago, she um, uh, spoke to us and told us what she was considering doing. And we said, look, we will not help hold you back. There's no way... Um, although it, it's an end of an era, right. um, it's a good opportunity for her to move on from a winemaking perspective. It's also um, from uh, from a, a, a fact that she's sort of um, in love with somebody. You know, that for us was the, was the most important thing. Well, you know, there's no way we were going to try to hold her back. Right. Um, she has to follow her heart and we wish her all the very, very best. So we advertised for a new winemaker about three months ago. Um, We let Rihanna and her two colleagues, Whitney, who looks after our office, and Renico, who's our senior seller assistant. He does everything else in the winery with Rihanna. They did the interviews for the... uh, We we whittled it down to a short list, and they did the first interviews with the, um, um, with the, the, the people that applied. Mm-hmm. And then we listened to their feedback. There was a couple of people they said they wouldn't like to work with for various reasons. Mm-hmm. So we knocked those out of the equation. And it came down to two people. And one of the guys was an English guy. And there are very few English winemakers. I guess you can count on one hand the amount of English winemakers in South Africa. Okay. Um, and he ticked every box. You know, we just couldn't fault the guy. He'd been trained in Burgundy. Um, he'd worked there in the vineyards and in the winery for four years. Been in South Africa over 10 years. Mm. And he's made his own wines for the last four or five years, or three or four years, sorry. Um, he set up, up a project which is coming to an end. And it just happened that he was in the right place at the right time. So our new winemaker is a guy called Gus Dale. And Gus has just started with us. And Rihanna's handed over um, a month's handover to him. So we now have a a new winemaker. And it's a new era for us. It offers us an opportunity to really step things up a little bit. And, you know, he's able to manage the business. And we're getting older, Vaughan and I. So we want to not take less of an an active role, but um, if we have somebody that can really take things to the next level for us, they can take this on as their their project. It's you know this was Rihanna's wines. Right. We didn't interfere in, in a winemaking, and we won't do that with with with, with Gus. Well, it's got to be exciting to know that you know you've you've helped groom and grow you know not only your business but Rihanna and her professional career, and, and you've sent her off yeah. in her way. Now you have this new challenge and new excitement of a new winemaker, and that's that that must bring its own set of excitement to you and to Vaughn and to to your to your team. Um, so, I mean, if you if you look back on your experience as a winery owner, you know you've been doing this for a while now. Uh, what lessons have you learned that you wish that maybe things that you wish you'd known at the at the beginning of this whole process? What do you wish you'd have known? I don't really know. I mean, that's um, that's a, a, a logical question to ask somebody that's that's done this. And you know, we all make mistakes in life, and we, you know, a lot of people that make a mistake um, will make that same mistake again because they'll probably have belief in people or whatever, and and it doesn't always work out. Um, you have to believe in people 
um, whatever business you're in. Um, I can't do things remotely. We can't make wines via a computer from the UK. Um, so it's like my cleaning business. My cleaning business um, isn't able, and I have nothing to do with that now. It's run and managed by somebody else, mm -hmm. and there's a great team in there. They're running and managing the business. They can drive the business forward, but we're still able. We, we still have an income from that business, which has enabled us to do this in the um, uh, with the vineyard. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have done that. You can't just start a vineyard with, with no money. It's a very huge capital intensive mm. thing i guess the way we've done it is probably the uh um the cheapest way of doing it um because you've sort of uh, you're, you're doing it um from scratch mm -hmm. so you're not buying a, a completed project product um but i don't know there are not many things there are not many things that i would say that i would possibly change um i think um We've done it all ourselves, so we haven't taken on partners or anything like that. Okay. Um, if I'd have met the right person, if we'd have met a winemaker, for instance, that was looking to set up his or her own vineyard mm -hmm. uh, and wanted um, somebody to work alongside them and put in the capital, that might have been a way of doing it. But um, the way it's happened, no, I think it's worked um it's worked perfectly well. All I know is, and I was told before we even went into this business, you know, people give you the uh, the, the old tale that if you want to make a million out of the wine business, you invest too. I mean, it's very true. It's very capital intensive. Um, people don't make a fortune out of uh, out of winemaking or out of um, wineries. Um, we probably make a, a, a profit if we sold sold it, but that was not our intention. Um, the beauty about it is, you know, taking something from nothing and then seeing people like you enjoying it, seeing it on the shelves of wine shops. And it's taken us to a lot of places in the world we wouldn't have been. It's also um, um, uh, given us um, opportunities to meet people, mm -hmm. um, some fantastic people within the industry. There's a great camaraderie within the industry. So even if we, I guess, lost every penny that we put into this business, you know, we we still we still have a um, a, a business that's thriving in the UK with Goldcrest Cleaning, and that business um, it makes more than enough money uh, for us. So even if we we lost every penny that we put in into it, I wouldn't see it as um, if you like a failure. Right. Um, uh, it's very much, um, it's very much uh, uh, the people that we've met and the experiences that we've had, we would never have had if we hadn't have set foot in the industry. Yeah, wine people are. I just love wine people. You know, the, especially you know, wine wine workers, people that know the industry, just have a whole different view of what wine's all about. And it's, I, I just love hanging out with wine people. Um, I, before we finish off this year, Tim, I want to let folks know the labels that you you bottle under and where in the united states they can find your wines sure um well as you know the um, um our uh, the name of our uh, our brand in most of the world is um seven springs vineyard um the vineyard name comes from seven natural springs uh, in the near nearby town of caledon and that took us about three years to come up with the name um but um, in the USA, you have a, um, there's a couple of Seven Springs vineyards in the USA. And when we were looking at exporting our wines there, we thought that there could be some kind of conflict. So the best way of, um, of uh, avoiding that or was to come up with an alternative name. So uh, we came up with a name of Over the Mountain that we are using in the USA as our brand. Now, over the mountain is a literal translation of the word Overberg, and Overberg is the Afrikaans name of the area that we're in in South Africa. Okay. Um, so that was a. That took me about five minutes to come up with that name. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how. And uh, so, over the mountain wines are sold in a few states in the USA. We have an importer based in Baltimore. Um, um, and they cover Baltimore, um, Maryland, sorry, uh, DC, New Jersey, uh, New York, and 
um, I think North Carolina. Okay. And we just had a new importer um, in Florida called PG Fine Wines. They're based in Davie and they're fantastic people. Awesome. And, you know, it's um, we had a fantastic uh, reception to our wines when they were, we were down there two, three weeks ago and uh, absolutely amazed at how people really took to the wines and liked the wines. So... Um, uh, guess look on our look on our website, and if anybody wants to buy the wines, I know that the states are a, a really um, um, different part of the world because each state is different. Mm-hmm. Um, we will be looking, and if there are anybody listening to this podcast, um, we are looking at uh, California. Uh, that would uh, as probably a standalone state mm-hmm. because we feel it's much easier to build up a relationship with probably an importer selling wines into one or two states. Right. You can build a personal relationship with them and you know, build your brand through them as we're doing with um, with PG Fine Wines in Davie. But um, yes, so um, look on our website and people, if they want to know, email us. We export to, the, um, to Denmark. In, in Europe, we export to Denmark, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, United Kingdom, and of all places, Italy. Now we have an importer in Italy, and the the term in the UK is uh, calls to Newcastle, um, you know, um, you know, or trying to sell oil to Arabs or something like that. Right. Um, but right. the Italians have just taken to our wines, and you know, this guy's based in the north of Italy. So those are the areas where our wines are sold in in the world at the moment. Wow. That's exciting. Um, I, I've, I've seen some photographs of you recently with a beautiful little baby, and you must be a brand new grandpa. Is that right? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the, the fact that we are grandpas. Yeah. yeah I uh, I'm a grandpa, not a, not another father. Yeah. We're just <laughs> look. The thing is, his, his name's Morgan. Um, uh, our youngest daughter, Kate, who's 21, uh, 21, 31. Sorry. Uh, Kate's first first baby, our first grandchild. He's now five months old. He's healthy. He's happy. And you know what? That's for us the most important. He's got two loving parents, and he's got a good set of uh, grandparents. So yeah, that, awesome. those th- those things are the most important things in life. Absolutely. I, I had to throw a plug in there for for a grandpa there. So Tim Pearson, you're an awesome guy. Your wines are incredible. If there's importers in California that are looking to carry amazing wines from South Africa, I hope they can help me connect with you. Um, Tim Pearson, thank you much for talking with us today. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure meeting you as well, Brad. Tim Pearson is the owner of Seven Springs Vineyard, a winery located in Hermanus, South Africa, and you can find his wines in the U.S. In, on the Over the Mountain label. Want to know more about Seven Springs Vineyard? Check out the website at 7, the number 7, springs.co.za. That's sevensprings.co.za. I'll post links to their website and contact information on my theoryofwine.com blog. Hey, wine friends. Thanks for hanging out with us for Theory of Wine podcast, brought to you by a new wine documentary called Wine Diamonds, Uncorking America's Heartland, now available online at winediamondsfilm.com and winerieboost.com, influence marketing for the wine industry. Thanks for listening, downloading, and sharing us. Find us at theoryofwine.com. See you next time. Cheers, friends.